Okay, welcome to a new section in our lectures, uh, part two. So part one was more about general ideas about how artists perceive the world um, and how they relate to their audiences and how audiences relate to them. So this part is going to be more technical. Uh, so the formal elements in their design, describing the art you see. Um, if you remember the definition of form is um, the lines and the colors and composition, basically what you see in the artwork. So in these ones, we'll talk about how artists use um, some of the formal elements. And we'll also talk about what the formal elements can mean um, in different cultures. So this lecture will be about line. So we'll talk about varieties of line, um, outline and contour, contour line, um, implied line, um, some of the qualities of line, um, expressive line, and also what that has meant, um, some of the content for that. Works in progress, we'll talk about Vincent van Gogh's The Sower um, and the contrast between analytic or classical line. All this stuff will be defined as we go along. Hung Lu's The Three Fujins, uh, Line and Cultural Convention, and Angra's The Turkish Bath. Um, and then we'll end as usual with um, a last slide that kind of brings everything together. So this is Cezanne, uh, and this piece is called The Basket of Apples. It's done in 1895. And Cezanne's idea was that uh, the still life, which is called Natur mort, um, which literally means dead nature. Um, that's the French phrase for um, the still life. And if, in a way, the way that the calling it a still life is one thing, but calling it dead nature um, says something even more about it. Um, usually, when you're a beginning artist, you do still life so that you can um, practice how to make shapes um and forms and such um but they don't move there's not really any dynamics to it and i don't mean move literally but they're they don't seem to have movement in the picture they they're meant to look still like they were that way when they painted it and had been that way for a long time we're gonna stay that way uh, so Cezanne, what he does is he wanted to change the way he painted so he could think up new ways to do things so he thought of himself as a um, student and he started doing still lives, but he wanted to do the still lives in a new way so he could change um, how he painted and do things in a new way. Um, so Cezanne tries to make a more dynamic composition. One of the ways you can do that is to look at this picture and it actually takes a little while, um, but you can pause it, uh, look at this picture and try to find what the visual mistakes are um, in other words, things that don't seem to match up, or you can just try to find things that seem kind of strange about uh, this particular still life. So pause it, see if you can find some things, and then you can start up again and I'll tell you about it. Uh, so one of the first things most students notice is that it looks like all these apples aren't very still. <laughs> it looks like this is falling over. You can kind of see how it's tilted and it's around. It doesn't seem like stay out way. Um, and the apples kind of like bounced out. Um, but he's painting it as a still life, so it seems like they're there forever. Um, but other things seem to be a little bit more strange. A lot of the um, elements in the picture are tilted, not just the basket of apples, um, but you can also see the dishes and this bottle of wine is pretty tilted. And then when you look at the table, you can kind of follow the back of the table here and then it doesn't seem to match. And then you kind of follow the side of the table. When we get to the front of the table, and then we go through here, and then it seems to start and stop in a different place again. And then we go to the back of the table here, and it doesn't match up to the middle of the table. Um, so we see almost like we're seeing the table from multiple points of view, maybe. Um, or he just wants us to think about what's going on, like, like when the magician um, is trying to make someone disappear or chop someone in half, and you think, what's going on inside of that box? 
uh, and that's what he's kind of pointing to. Um, so by changing the way that the lines are, it gives us an impression that something is happening, something is moving. So there's a lot of variety of lines uh, in this John Tingley piece. Um, we can see pretty much any line you could imagine. So the idea with showing this picture is basically to give you an overview of almost every kind of line you can use. Uh, so when I read this, like try to think of if you can see some of these lines. Um, lines seem to possess direction. They can rise and fall, head off to the left or right, disappear in a distance. Lines can divide one thing from the other, or they can connect things. They can be thick or thin, long or short, smooth or agitated. Lines also reflect uh, movement in nature. So you can probably find all of those examples just by looking at this picture um, and maybe find a few more lines that weren't even mentioned in that one. So outline and contour line. Um, and these are some things that you probably know about um, from doing it, but may not know exactly what they refer to. Because usually when you draw when you're younger, you'll use outlines um, and then sometimes contour lines. Uh, so an outline is the line on the outside and it doesn't always use, like if you see a realistic painting, you won't see them. But the outline on an outside that traces out the form of an object. So an outline would be this black one going all the way around here. So we can see another outline here. It's kind of confusing to follow because uh, Picasso likes to mess around a little bit. So the outline in the picture is like that. Um, whereas contour lines are a little bit different. Um, a contour line would be something that de define three-dimensional spaces. Uh, so if you notice this one, it just has lines. There's no shading, which we'll talk about later on but this figure looks three-dimensional. So how that's done is we do have some outlines here, but then we have count contour lines, like this line going down the back of the figure uh, and then the lines on the face. And contour lines basically draw um, a shape and make it look like it has three dimensions. Uh, so those are contour lines. And sometimes a line can be both, but generally, if you're talking about outline, you're talking about the overall shape. And when you talk about contour line, you're talking about defining um, three-dimensional spaces. So an applied line is a line that isn't literally there, but depending on how you arrange the lines that are there, um, the viewer will tend to see them. Um, so this particular piece by Keith Haring called Untitled, which is what most of his pieces are called, it's from 1982, um, has um, a couple of implied lines. So if you look at this picture, is there something, do you see some movement going on? So what most people see in this picture is they see a movement of these lines that makes it look like the hands are waving back and forth vigorously. Um, so that's kind of an implied line. We're imagining these hands moving because of these real lines. And then um, a lot of people see because of the way that these little dot animals and the lines are next to them, that there's lines that go through the body of the figure. Um, so this particular picture was a work in response to the assassination of John Lennon, um, who was assassinated by someone, I guess you could call him a fan, he actually just recently got out of jail. Um, and I think what Keith Haring was trying to say here um, is he's talking about how celebrities, um, in some ways, famous people can get things projected onto them um, that don't have anything to do with them. Um, and it can be kind of dangerous. Um, all of these fans, um, sure, you can get lots of money and such, but. Um, very, very small number of them might be dangerous to you. Uh, and that's what we're kind of seeing here. So sometimes you can make implied lines in three dimensions and the pieces will uh, kind of make lines over time. Uh, so this is Alexander Calder, who we looked at in the last lecture and it's called Dots and Dashes. And this is actually a mobile. Um, and if you're ever in a, in a, in a museum, 
and they're in one of the modern art sections, I look towards the ceiling because a lot of times they'll have one of these mobiles. Uh, they'll often put it in big hallways too, because if there's just a slight breeze, um, they will move very slowly over time and they will take on different lines. So if you look at the middle picture and then look at the band of pictures on the right, this is all the same artwork. Um, and you can't usually see these things moving. Um, so it moves very slowly over time, um, but it gives the impression of lines that connect these different ways these different shapes and also just the lines that we perceive. Like if you look at the main picture, you kind of perceive a line, a curve going here and a curve going here and then another line here. Uh, and then if you look at the other pictures, you follow other lines. This one you have um, just a, a couple of lines, almost like making a broomstick or something like that. Um, so he called his pieces, uh, not mobiles, although that word had already been used before, he called them kinetic sculptures. In other words, sculptures that move, and in this case, it moves by itself. So sometimes you'll see a picture and the implied lines will make a certain type of composition. So um, a kind of arrangement of uh, the elements in a picture that make a shape. Uh, and they'll also kind of express an idea out of that. So this is a pretty good one. Um, the artist is Titian, uh, and it's the Assumption and Consecration of the Virgin. Um, so Catholics, who are, are you know, the biggest kind of Christian religion, um, they believe that Mary, uh, when she died, um, instead of um, dying and then being buried, uh, instead of that happening, she was assumed directly into heaven. So that's what we're seeing here. We're seeing Jesus' apostles who kind of hung out with Mary after Jesus died. Um, and we see them kind of reaching towards the sky, and then Mary has all of these angels um, and pooty. That's what these babies with, with <laughs> wings are called, uh, and they're kind of uh, you know, lifting her up in a cloud, and then we have a God the Father type figure um, at the top also with an angel. But if you start to think about lines that are implied by people's eyes, uh, the shapes of people's arms, you can kind of see some shapes being made. So we see this figure, we see a line here, we see these figures, we see a line over here. And if you keep just kind of following them, you'll make a nice triangle right here. So what that tends to do is if you start at the bottom of the painting, you want to lift up to Mary's face. And then what does Mary's face do? It does the same thing, it leads upwards, and we almost have like an upside down triangle. And then when we get to the God, the father face, he looks right back down. Um, so you can actually draw these um, lines of sight. So the picture is separated in those three sections. And then these lines of sight and the, and the lines made by um, the figure's gestures kind of connect different parts of the pictures together. So three part compositions are cool. They can separate their picture in an interesting way. Um, but if artists use line to um, unite them together, it can get the viewer to um, kind of move throughout the picture and make them more dynamic, meaning they seem to have movement. So some of the qualities of line, um, Pat Steer is an artist uh, in the late 20th century. who did these, this really cool series it was called a dictionary of marks. Um, she uses the lines of famous artists to construct her dictionary. So basically we, what you would do is you'd see a page and there'd be a square. Um, and on the outside of the page, outside of the square, there'd be a bunch of lines that would represent an artist. And then um, Pat would try to reproduce like the most typical line in the middle of the square. Um, and it's pretty cool because a lot of times, even if you don't know who Pat is referring to, um, you can kind of guess who the artist is. Like many of you might not have been able to guess this one, um, but it's possible to do um, if you know a lot about Rembrandt. So this is Rembrandt. He did paintings as, as well, but the line that Pat is trying to um, um, reproduce here is the types of lines that were used in Rembrandt's prints. So you can see those lines. This is Rembrandt's print on the right. Um, and Pat Steer has this interesting little quote the self is like a bug. Every time you smack it, it moves to another place. Uh, so sometimes autographic lines 
um, they don't last over time for the same artist. So if you look at the um, kind of Dictionary of Lion Pains play, uh, page for Van Gogh, you might have recognized this just by the way the paint strokes are kind of circled around and thick and all about the same size. Um, even if you're not an expert in art, you might have recognized this is Van Gogh. Uh, so we call these types of lines where when you see it, you can recognize, hey, that's a particular artist that uses that, an autographic line. Any use of line is distinct to the artist, employs it, and is therefore recognizable as a kind of signature style. Uh, so this is Van Gogh's uh, The Starry Night, uh, and he's using these same sorts of lines where it seems to have um, the same sort of thickness. In a lot of these pictures, he's literally using his fingers, and that's probably the reason why they have the same thickness. Uh, and they seem to have movement throughout the picture. And Van Gogh, if you look at his earliest pictures, um, they don't have his signature line necessarily. You can recognize maybe other things about his art, um, but his signature line developed over time. Um, so one of the first pieces that they used it in was the sewer. Um, and you can see here, they're all about the same size, uh, but they're swirling around. And when people see the pictures, uh, a lot of times these, the swirling of these lines makes it look like things are moving. So in the sower, um, he's doing a picture of a farmer and wheat fields. And if you've ever been or even seen it on TV, um, a wheat field and seen it on a windy day or even a place where there's a lot of tall grass, the wheat field seems to kind of like move and flow like the waves in the ocean almost. Um, and he really liked that. It showed that it was alive along with showing the sun, wheat, all things that are yellow and that bring life. Um, he realized he could create some movement. Um, so what's kind of cool is the previous painting, The Starry Night, uh, that's the one we're talking about, um, not this painting. But the previous painting, um, Starry Night, there's not really anything known about it because um, he didn't write about it. But with most of his other paintings, he wrote in letters, uh, and sent them to people, and most of those letters survive today. Um, so you can see in some of these letters, he's talking about how he's just trying to sketch something very quickly, and he realizes by doing that, that he's creating a lot of movement. Um, so he tries to intentionally, and that's what we see in the one on the left, um, make a picture to incorporate that movement idea, and it seems to work. Um, he feels like a little bit of that kind of wavy um, type of movement on a windy day in a field like this. Um, so his autographic line was definitely developed um, partially accidentally, but also partially intentionally. So when you look up close, if you saw this, even without the colors that Van Gogh is known for, um, you might be able to see uh, the movement that's happening in his lines. Uh, so I'll give you a link to where, if you're interested, um, where you can find some of Van Gogh's letters. There's two different websites that use them, and they're super cool. Uh, each of them, you can actually look up a painting, and then you can find letters that reference the paintings. You won't be able to find a letter for The Starry Night, but you will be able to find letters for lots of other paintings. So I'll put both of those links in the description for this video. So lines can also have thought of to have um, emotions or ideas. Um, so the classic um, contrast is between um, an expressive line, which we'll talk about in a moment, and then analytical or classical line. So analytical and classical line um, are basically the same type of line. And this way of thinking of analytical or classical line versus expressive line um, comes from Western culture. And it's not necessarily used in other art cultures. So it develops with the ancient Greeks, but it's not something that's necessarily used by other cultures. Um, so this is Solowitz, the lines from four corners to a point of a grid. And this is something that you can easily recognize as analytic line. Um, so one of the things that analytic line can be is it's straight lines, uh, it's perpendiculars, uh, it makes shapes like triangles. Uh, we're not seeing in rectangles, we're not seeing curves. 
Um, so with this particular piece, Solowit actually doesn't necessarily get involved with these pieces. Um, each gallery or museum constructs this piece based on Lewitt's constructions, some leeway for each place, piece um, to interpret it, plan on a grid. What art looks like is not too important. That's what Sol Lewitt has. But this is really analytical. He's basically giving them mathematical formulas for how to create the piece. And then um, workers that are pretty skilled but aren't necessarily artists reproduce these pieces. Um, so this is like kind of an unusual way of doing uh, analytical or classical line. Another way is you can kind of mix together um, what are normally considered to be expressive lines. And that would be these like chunky paints, which are kind of like what we saw in Van Gogh and Jasper John's number and color. Uh, but then a very literal analytic line in that this is just a perfect grid where all the rectangles are the same size and all the numbers look like the types of numbers you would get if you were doing stencils or something like that. Um, so with this one, it's hard to say. Uh, we do have some expressive line like Van Gogh would have, lines that have curves and seem to have movement um, with all of these colors. But then you can also see some of the analytical line um, with the grid that's made. So the traditional way the analytic line is used and ancient Egyptians also used line in this way. So it goes back to um, even before the ancient Greeks. Uh, this is Jacques-Louis de Davy um, and he planned out all of his paintings step by step. So by the time it went onto the canvas, he already knew exactly what was gonna be there. This is his study for the death of Socrates, which we're gonna look at in a moment. And you can see his date, 1787. Uh, and he was painting during a time that was called the neoclassic period. Um, in other words, artists, um, they look back to ancient Greece and Rome and what they considered to be some of the ideals. Uh, and they tried to bring back those ideals, um, not just in art, but they also felt like the founding of Republican governments that happened in France and in the United States. And Republican doesn't mean like the, the political party in the United States. It means an elected government. Um, that a Republican government is looking back to uh, the ancient Roman Republic, for instance. Uh, so if you, for instance, if you go to Washington, D.C., you'll see that most of the buildings are done in this style that looks kind of like a mixture of ancient Greece and ancient Rome. That was, those were designed along the same ideas as these paintings that Jacques-Louis Davy is doing. Um, so they call this classical line as well as analytical line. And it's similar to Greek art, um, and that he's using a canon proportions. Egyptians did this as well. So he makes a grid and he makes all the different body parts of the figures fit into that grid so that they have this kind of mathematical proportion in between them. But he also has the figures fit into the grid in such a way that even though they have curves because humans have them, uh, he's making straight lines. So you can see how Socrates' shoulder and his hand meet along this line and then we go through and we can go through his other arm. So even though he has curves, if you look at the grid lines, um, he's mostly, uh, we mostly have straight lines, angles, and perpendiculars. So what is he trying to say with this type of picture? You can see it in the finished picture. Um, so Socrates, and the grid is kind of uh, implied by the brick wall in the background. He's got straight lines you know, curves of his body. Um, but again, if we go through, we see straight lines. Um, and Socrates, uh, if you're not familiar with the story, um, Socrates is a real historical person. Um, so this happened as far as we know. Um, he was a teacher in ancient Greece. And um, he's famous for asking his students questions that get him to question some fundamental assumptions they might have about how the world works, um, which I think is a fun thing to do. Um, he gets them basically to teach themselves um, to think about, well, what might be some of the ideas I have about the world that could be incorrect? Um, but what happens when you ask those kinds of questions is oftentimes um, some of the people with power, uh, politicians or business people, uh, landlords, people like that, um, you know, the students of Socrates might start to question whether they should have that type of power or if anyone should have that type of power. Um, so many of these powerful people became angry with Socrates uh, 
uh, and asked him to change his teachings, um, to go back on some of the things he said, and he refused to do so. Um, and then mocked them <laughs> for the, the um, fake kangaroo court that they put him in. And they became even more angry and um, they sentenced him to death. Since he was a well-respected teacher, they gave him the option to be able to commit suicide, which was considered to be honorable, uh, which he took. Um, and he used uh, hemlock, I don't know about ancient Greek poisons, but hemlock is in this um, cup that's being handed by one of uh, Socrates' friends and students. And he's going to kill himself, basically die for his ideas. Um, so that's kind of the main point, one of the main points that um, David wants to say here, that ideas are worth dying for. And David, um, who was part of the French Revolution, that's what some of the people in the revolution thought they were doing. They were dying for ideas. So they might die, but they could create a, an idea of how the world should work and it would make it better for future people. Um, so he's portrayed as doing something rational because he's using, they're using all analytic lines. But as you can see, um, some of his followers, they're not really into that. They don't want Socrates to die. They love their, their teacher or their friend. And you can see how they're portrayed is quite different. All the lines that are made, like look at this figure, there's curvy lines that are made. If we look at this figure right here, there's a long curve that's made. Um, and we can see the same thing with a lot of the other figures. We can see they're pained and they're sad. Uh, but according to this way of thinking of line, even if we didn't see their faces, we could tell that they were emotional um, because at that time, um, the idea of classical line is that curvy lines are associated with emotion and straight lines like on Socrates are associated with rationality. Unfortunately, both the ancient Greeks, uh, but not the ancient Egyptians, but both the ancient Greeks and um, a lot of people who were making art at the time of Davi looked at straight lines and rationality as being associated with masculinity and curved lines and emotions associated with femininity. Um, so literally saying that feminine things are irrational but emotional and uh, masculine things are um, rational and unemotional. And you can see that kind of thinking, <laughs> and I'll do a little Socrates here if you think about how this affects people, where sometimes um, many men in society will say, well, um, women are crazy or emotional. And then um, whenever the men themselves get emotional, they'll say that their beliefs aren't based on emotion and it's just rationality. Um, so this type of thinking can be also very misogynistic at the same time. So a contrast where we have lots of expressive lines uh, and I think even before you see the finished picture, this is a, a sketch to kind of draw out some of the lines for a piece of the picture. Before you see the finished picture, you can see with all of these lines going this way and that, and there's a lot of chaos, even if you don't recognize what's in the picture. Um, so this is uh, Eugène's Delacroix, the study for the death of Sardanapalus, so a drawing before the picture. This is quite different than the one we saw from Devi. Um, there's Romantic, which... Um, in the time of the 19th century, the romantic period um, referred to not necessarily romantic love, but just emotion in general. So romantic art is emotional art. Um, so they, since they intentionally wanted to make emotional art, they would use these curvy lines uh, and even make them chaotic in a way. So to create more expression. And in the case of the death of Sardinopolis, it fits the subject perfectly. Um, so for this particular painting, um, the subject is Sardanapalus, who is a king from ancient uh, Syria. I'm actually not sure if he's more of a legendary figure or um, a real historical figure, uh, but the story is that there was an invading army um, that was encroaching on the territory of Sardanapalus um, at his palace. And as they became closer and closer um, after a siege, 
a siege is when you surround a city and try to starve everybody out. Um, the defenses that are around Sardanopolis, who is the king right here, um, started to fall apart. And he saw that he was inevitably going to lose. So then he ordered his um, soldiers uh, and his servants uh, to destroy everything. Um, so take all the valuable items, items that are made out of gold and other valuable materials, materials and set them on fire. You can see all the fires in the background um, and kill all of his prized horses. And um, in this picture, he's showing that Sardanopolis had a harem. Uh, so many women that were there um, to service him sexually also have them murdered. Uh, so you can kind of see that the idea is that women are ownership in this case. So to create the chaos of such a scene, um, having these very expressive and chaotic lines works perfectly. Um, and you know you can almost squint your eyes and see the little bit, which is right here, of the lines from the drawing from the previous slide. Um, so by creating just curved lines and not a lot of um, you know, orderly lines that you can follow, uh, it creates chaos in a picture. It creates a lot of emotion. So with this artist, Hung Lu, um, she's using lines in multiple ways. Uh, so Hung Lu is still alive today. Uh, and I'll put a link to um, her website and some other stuff in the description to this video. This is her piece, Virgin Vessel. And um, Hung Lu, as her name implies, is a Chinese artist, but she moved to the United States to study, and then she decided to stay there. But when she went back to China, um, she collected some photographs that were from the 19th century. Um, that's what's known as the Qing Dynasty period in, in China. And um, some of the photos she collected were of sex workers that worked in brothels. Uh, so it's kind of important to understand in this one is that um, nowadays, obviously, there's sex workers that choose to do uh, that kind of work and some that don't. Um, but in China at this time, nobody was choosing to do that kind of work. Um, oftentimes, um, if a family had some horrible debts that they couldn't pay off, um, they would um, sell one of their feminine children um, to a brothel, um, and then they would be kind of raised to be a sex worker. Um, so that's what we're seeing here in this picture. The red square that's in the middle isn't original to the picture, but um, the rest of it, not these, these um, char Chinese characters aren't original in the picture either. The rest of it is original in the picture. And you can see what they did when she was a child, they bound her feet so that um, they would eventually Kind of, you could see her toes would squish together. And then when they had shoes on, you would have these very small feet. Uh, so only sex workers and elite women were expected to do this. Um, and it would make it very difficult for them to walk around normally. Um, and, but with their shoes on, it was, a, it was considered to be beautiful. So one of the things that Hung Lu does with line here is you can see that it looks very photographic um, when she's portraying a figure. Um, but then she starts to have lines in the picture that are kind of um, dripping downwards. And she does this more and more as she goes along. And it can kind of express some emotion towards a picture. So with this one, the three Fujins, um, even though it's elite women uh, and not sex, sex workers or basically slaves working in a brothel, we do see like that they are trapped um, in some ways as well. So it's called the Three Fujins. And who these would be is um, China was had an emperor until um, near the beginning of the 20th century. Um, and that's when this picture was taken while there was still an emperor. Uh, the emperor's palace was set up in such a way that once the emperor moved into the palace when he was a child, uh, he would never leave um, this big square, uh, which is called Peking nowadays, um, but it would be called the Forbidden City. city. Um, so kind of walls around this pretty large complex. So, you know, about as big as, as Henry Ford's campus, maybe bigger. Um, 
and all of these buildings. But once um, the emperor moved in there, he could never leave. And then when the emperor would get married, um, he would have multiple wives. So he'd usually marry um, one woman and that would be some kind of political reason. Uh, and all of his sisters would usually be married to the emperor as well uh, or married to the family of the emperor. And they would all move in and they could never leave. And then um, the emperor would have multiple girlfriends. Uh, that's who these figures are. Um, and the girlfriends would usually come from elite families who were trying to get some influence basically with the emperor um, because you couldn't see him. He never left. So the only way that you could get some influence is, is, is to try to send somebody in there. Um, and once the girlfriends came in, they could never leave as well. Um, and the only women other than the emperor that were allowed to be, um, the only men, I mean, that were allowed to be there, um, were men who were eunuchs. Uh, in other words, they were made non-men. Um, they had their generals removed any idea of the, of the Chinese at this time. Uh, so it was a strange thing to live in a forbidden city. Um, you had the best food and all of these servants that were taking care of you and incredible clothes and incredible makeup um, and people that could do your hair and take care of your body and your skin and everything. And you would look beautiful every day, um, but you could never leave. Um, so what Hung Lu does is she's using line um, in a similar way to the last picture, but even more extreme. She applies lines towards the top of the picture um, after she paints the figures. Um, the last thing she does is she kind of applies some lines that are really thin. They have extra linseed oil um, in them. So oil paints are made by mixing together pigment and oil. If you put a lot of oil in it, um, the paint won't stick and it'll drip down the page. And a lot of people interpret these lines in different ways. Sometimes people look like the figures are crying, even though we see their faces are kind of blank. Uh, it's almost like tears are falling down their eyes. Um, Hung Lu, and I'll give you a link to this video, um, she talks about how it kind of um, fades the picture out. It's almost like you're looking at it through a screen. She'll say it in more detail in the picture. And it makes it look like a memory. So these pictures are from a while back. Um, and it's almost like if you think about memories in your own life, sometimes they seem a little faded uh, and that can do that thing. And in this picture, she does a really interesting thing where these bird cages are actually real bird cages, three-dimensional bird cages, and they're stuck to the canvas. Uh, the figures in this canvas are like a bit larger in life size. And if you think about what I said about the three fusions, they have everything they want. They can look really beautiful, but they can never leave. Uh, that's kind of like a bird in a cage. Um, birds are some of the most beautiful animals with the bright colors. Um, and when people keep them as pets, they do one of the things that they take away, one of the things that makes them so powerful and incredible, uh, their freedom by clipping their wings so they can't fly away or putting them in the cage so they can't fly away. Um, so one of the things that you can see uh, with the types of paintings that um, Hung Lu does is that there's the types of lines she does to make the main parts of the picture, realistic parts of the picture, um, aren't really the types of stuff that you would see in traditional Chinese art. However, when she was growing up um, in China, um, it was Maoist China, uh, and he was really interested in having, uh, if you're not familiar, Mao was the head of the Communist Party and he won the revolution in 1947 in China. Um, and it was a Marxist revolution. And the, um, that's still the type of government that China has today. Um, although I don't know if communism would be the right word to describe it since it's very capitalistic. Um, but anyway, Mao, um, he thought that Chinese artists should do things more like Western artists. So they should make things look realistic. Um, so you weren't really allowed to do traditional Chinese arts, which are really about using expressive lines. Um, Kind of like the earlier size where you looked at signature line, um, the artists of this time in China um, thought that line could show something about the character of the person. So when she was young, she was trained in the Western way to make very clear line that just makes the picture happen. 
But then when she came to the United States, um, she learned actually more about traditional Chinese art and she started to be more interested in expressive line. So she mixed these, these two ideas together into her work. Uh, so again, I'll put some links to some of her stuff in the description of this video so you can see some more details. So line and cultural convention, we've already been talking about it a bit. Um, so this is either Poseidon or Zeus. Um, whenever this uh, bronze sculpture was found, uh, and that date is correct, 460 BC, it was found in a shipwreck. Um, and it was kind of dirty, but they cleaned it off, you know, cleaned all the barnacles off it, and this is what it looked like. Amazing, right? Um, and it stands on its own. Um, you can see the piece is six feet, 10 inches high, um, but you don't need anything to help this figure stand up, stands up perfectly. Uh, so you would say that these lines are literally balanced, um, both visually, uh, but they also stop the piece from falling over. Uh, so for the ancient Greeks, they traditionally saw these straight lines that we see in this picture. Oh, I forgot to say, we don't know it's Poseidon or Zeus because whatever he was holding his hand is missing. Uh, if it was Poseidon, Poseidon, it would be a trident, which is like a spear with uh, three tines to it. Uh, and then if it was Zeus, it would be something that, this kind of spear that looks like a lightning bolt, basically. So that's missing. So we don't know which one it is. We just know from um, the proportions of the figure that he's one of those. So in ancient Greece, and again, they associated this with real life masculinity and femininity. So it was really a patriarchal way of thinking. Um, the classical straight lines, and we see that he's making all straight lines and triangles here, uh, that represents, again, like perfection, idealization, uh, and rationality. Uh, and we're seeing that in Zeus here. So curved lines that like you would see, this is a Roman copy, but it's a, it's a copy of an ancient Greek work that was originally in bronze. You can see that um, Aphrodite has lots of curves. She doesn't have these perfectly straight and perpendicular lines like Zeus or Poseidon has. Um, and Aphrodite was a very important goddess, um, but she's also representing something that um, Greeks as people wouldn't want, um, emotion. So the classical, um, for the ancient G Greeks, or at least the way it was thought of by later people as well, is these straight lines, uh, and that's considered to be masculine and then expressive through the female form, um, is considered to be feminine. And again, this is a pretty limiting way of looking at gender roles, uh, and that has unfortunately made its way into thinking today. So in this one, we see both of them that are kind of sent up in a gender way. Although interestingly, when you see this picture done sometimes, uh, Jupiter also has um, a, a masculine kind of person who has a crush on him and he's often portrayed with curvy lines uh, like Thetis is in this one. Uh, so we have Jupiter, that's just another way of saying Zeus. And again, we have all straight lines, pretty amazing shoulders and chest right there. <laughs> uh, all straight lines and he's looking straight at us. And then we can see all curved lines. So this was also made by Angra, who's working at around the same time as David, and he's working in a neoclassical style. So he's showing the masculine classical analytic line uh, for Jupiter, and then for Thetis, uh, the very curvy line. And remember, they relate this to emotion as well. So a lot of times when you see these pictures done enough, um, it can kind of make associations in viewers um, about this is how men are, this is how women are. Uh, and it certainly though reflects how people in certain times thought of men and women. Uh, so again, it can be a, something that can um, kind of justify the part, patriarchy in a way. You'd say, well, well, women might ask, why are men in charge? And then men at this time can say, well, because we're irrational and we're not so emotional. Um, and, you know, the artwork of the time will tend to reflect the way people thought about those sorts of things. Uh, certainly not women, but elite people. So in this bathing woman, you can see that she has so many curves, it almost looks like there's no bones inside of her body. Uh, she's just completely soft. Um, and this picture which is called bathing woman. Um, kind of developed into this picture. You can see how the bathing woman appears again. And um, it's called the Turkish bath. So artists at this time, going from the neoclassical 
transitioning into a period called the Romantic period. And then in the last portion of this course, we'll talk about all of these styles. They started becoming interested, and I'll put the air quotes up, exotic themes. Exotic for them meant from other places in the world, um, like for instance, what they called the Orient, which is nowadays called the Middle East. So basically anything that is east of Turkey um, going into uh, Iran, basically. So what we call the Middle East and Afghanistan. Um, but usually they would do Turkish things because Europeans didn't really know what was going on in the rest of the Middle East. And so that's one of the, the ideas, having this exotic theme of a harem um, that um, a sultan would have or something like that. But if you notice in the harem, he puts all these very, very um, light-skinned women. Uh, so kind of implying that the sultan is stealing away women from Northern Europe or something like that, because uh, he has to have white-skinned women. Uh, and you can see how all of these women are just curves. They're very soft. They don't seem to have bones inside of them. Uh, they're very idealized form, uh, so very curvy and soft. Um, and if you look closely at some of the pictures, you may recognize some of the poses. Um, all you have to do right now is if you want is open up Instagram uh, and look up some Instagram female models um, and you'll be able to find a lot of these poses being used. And when you think about these poses, a lot of them um, position the woman in such a way uh, that she's basically um, very vulnerable. Uh, and that is kind of a leftover, again, of these thinking of these ideas um, in our modern society. So when you think about what is the use of traditional female lines say about Anger's intent, um, you can also think about, well, what does it say if we still have these types of poses and we associate it with this with feminine? And if we saw like a man pose like this, we would think it was odd. Um, so think about kind of like what these mean and how they relate to these very ancient ideas um, about men and women. So the last one, we can put all of these together. And um, this is Robert Maplethorpe, who we looked at before. Uh, and this is his photograph. And it's part of a series they did of Lisa Lyon. So Lisa Lyon uh, was a winner of the first world's women's bodybuilding championship. Uh, so when you see her in this picture, you're probably thinking, well, she's not that big and muscular. Uh, but at that time, um, there weren't that many women that got into bodybuilding yet. Um, and this was like an incredibly lean and muscular for women at the time. <laughs> so um, she was pretty, she was pretty um, ripped compared to other women at the time. Nowadays, you might see an actress will do like an action hero role and she'd look you know, even more muscular in this. Uh, but Lisa Lyon at the time um, was kind of sticking out from women. Interestingly, and maybe I can find a link to it, um, later on, there were other women that um, did bodybuilding where they tried to get really bulky, uh, like some of the male bodybuilders, and there became kind of a um, conflict in the next year's competition in the 1980 Women's Bodybuilding Championship. Um, I'll give you a link to that video because it actually will kind of um, continue along with some of the ideas that we're looking at as far as masculinity and femininity in line. So what I would do with this, and I'm not going to provide the answers for you, but if you want to go to the extra credit board, this is a way you can bring all the ideas together. Uh, so does Lyon present herself in classical or romantic terms? So look at her pose and see, do we see romantic lines or do we see classical lines? Uh, how does the photograph subvert or contest conventional representations of the female figure? Uh, so you might want to look up, like Google some things from the 1970s or 1960s of how women were usually portrayed, and then compare this to Lisa Lyon in this picture. So is Lyon closer to Jupiter or Thetis that we looked at earlier, Zeus or Aphrodite? And then try to think about what the implications are. Um, so this is a good way to review what happened in this, and that's it for this lecture. <laughs>